Hello, I'm Miles Humberstone. I'm a neurologist from Nottingham and uh, my task today is to take you through neurology for the MRCP. Now, neurology is one of those subjects that scares people who are entering the MRCP. It seems being a huge and uh, varied subject, full of minutiae, that's impossible to learn. If you look at the, uh, the uh, past test database, you'll see that most of the questions on it are scored very difficult. Um, my job today is to try to take you through neurology and to show you that actually it is very manageable. There are a few lists of things that you need to know, but most of it you can get through with a little bit of core knowledge and a few uh, logical rules to follow. So we're breaking it down into three lectures. The first lecture, we're going to start by covering neuroanatomy of the spinal cord, the brain, and visual fields. And we'll carry on in logical progression through, through neurology. So without further ado, let's start. Question one. A 31-year-old man presents with weakness of his right leg. Examination reveals decreased proprioception sensation in the right leg and absent pinprick sensation in the left leg. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, Guillain-Barre syndrome, B, an intramedullary spinal cord glioma, C, Brown-Saccard syndrome, D, anterior spinal artery occlusion, or E, a lumbosacral disc herniation? I'll give you a minute to think about that. So, the correct answer is C, a brown saccade syndrome. The clue is in the fact that spinothalamic pinprick sensation is on the opposite side to the weakness and to the proprioception. So, if we look at a diagram of the spinal cord, you'll be able to see why that should be. So all you need to remember about the spinal cord is three tracts. Dorsally you've got the dorsal columns and then more laterally you've got the corticospinal tract going down, taking motor pathways down and then more anteriorly you've got the spinothalamic tract and the fibres coming here you'll see cross for spinothalamic sensation to the opposite side going on to the opposite spinothalamic tract. So when you have a hemicord lesion affecting one side of the cord, you get dorsal column and weakness on one side, but you get spinothalamic loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side. Let's move on to the next question. So now that we've got that diagram of the spinal cord in mind, Let's see if we can tackle some other questions. Here's question two. 64-year-old smoker presents to the emergency department with a 12-hour history of weakness in the legs and inability to pass urine. Physical examination reveals that he's hypertensive, he's got a pyramidal weakness in the lower limbs, pain and temperature and sensation are impaired to T7, but vibration and joint position are unaffected in the lower limbs. What's the most likely diagnosis? And here are the five options. And again, I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay. So, hopefully you remembered that diagram of the spinal cord. So, what we've got here is a loss of the spinothalamic sensation, which, if you remember, is anterior in the cord, but preservation of proprioception, which is posterior, and of, there's a, some involvement of power, which is halfway between the two. If you look at the diagram, you can see how that can happen. So this pattern of weakness and sensory loss is typical of an anterior spinal artery occlusion. The anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. The posterior third is supplied by lots of small posterior spinal arteries. But the anterior spinal artery, there's one large artery, which is the artery of Adamkiewicz, which comes into the spinal cord 
at about T1. So typically you'd get a sensory level somewhere around there and the common causes would be atherosclerosis but if it's associated with pain you need to think carefully about the possibility of an aortic dissection. So let's carry on and see if we can answer some more spinal cord questions. Question three. A 50-year-old man complains of a sharp pain over the left shoulder and the upper trunk, exacerbated by coughing. He's noticed that when he places his left hand in the bath, he's unable to feel the temperature accurately. What's the most likely diagnosis? And here are the five options below. And again, I'll give you a minute to think about that. So, the clue here is that when he places his hand in the bath, he can't feel the temperature. That implies that other sensation is preserved. And temperature sensation, of course, is spinothalamic. So we're looking for something here within the spinal cord that selectively affects spinothalamic sensation. So let's look at the diagram again to see how that can happen. OK. So the, the important thing here is the crossing of the fibres. You can see here that the spinothalamic fibres cross, and as they cross, they pass very close to the central canal of the spinal cord. A syrinx is an abnormal expansion of the central canal. So the story of worsening with coughing is very typical. What happens when you cough is that a pressure wave is driven down the central canal, and it expands the syrinx a bit. So... As the syrinx gets bigger, the first thing that you get is involvement of the crossing fibres of the spinothalamic tract. So what you get is a suspended sensory level to pain and temperature. As the syrinx continues to expand, the next thing that gets picked off is the ventral horn, we can see on the diagram there. That's where all the anterior horn cells are, that's where the motor nerve cell bodies are. So the next thing that happens is that you get a loss of the motor nerves and you get atrophy. So typically, if it's in the upper thoracic cord, which would be the commonest place, you get a T1 motor loss and wasting of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. And then as it gets bigger and bigger, you start to get pyramidal signs in the lower limbs, but that's much further down the stream. So the classic presentation is with the suspended sensory level and then later with the muscle weakness and wasting in the the intrinsic muscles of the hands. So, let's move on to another question about the spinal cord, just to make sure you've got it all completely under wraps. A 40-year-old woman with a history of Graves' disease presents with a six-month history of progressive tingling and weakness in the legs. On examination of the lower limbs, there's bilateral pyramidal weakness, depressed deep tendon reflexes, and flexor plantar responses. There's a reduced joint position sense and vibration sense in the lower limbs, but no other sensory abnormalities. What's the most likely cause? And here again are your five options below. I'll give you another minute to think about those. And the answer is B12 deficiency. The clues here are the history of autoimmunity and the pattern of sensory loss. So this is the opposite pattern to that which we've seen with an anterior spinal artery problem in that she's got preservation of other sensory modalities but loss of joint position and vibration. If you look at the diagram you can see that why that might be. So B12 deficiency picks out the dorsal columns fairly preferentially. It also affects the descending corticospinal tract, so you do get weakness, but the first thing you get is the proprioceptive loss. You also get a peripheral neuropathy involved with it, which is why you get the loss of ankle reflexes. So, although this question was slightly atypical in that she had flexor planters, this is part of your list of absent ankle jerks and extensor planters, which was one of the key lists that you need to have for MRCP. So B12 deficiency is in there. Neurosyphilis is in there, and you saw that was in, in the original question options. 
Neurosyphilis is very rare these days, and the, uh, the clue there was, was that there's the family history of autoimmunity. Friedreich's ataxia is another favourite for membership. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. It's actually a mitochondrial disease. The, 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 the problem is one of iron transport within the mitochondria, and it leads to a multi-system disorder, including spinal cord problems and uh, peripheral neuropathy. Motor neuron disease can cause any combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs. So that's in the list. The conus medullaris is that pointy bit at the bottom of the spinal cord where the tip of the spinal cord is surrounded by nerve roots. So a lesion at that level can easily cause a combination of upper and lower motor neuron problems. Diabetes is in most MRCP lists. Peripheral neuropathy in diabetes is obviously very common. To get the upgoing planters, you'd have to have some other complication of the diabetes, for example, the stroke. Um, in clinical practice, cervical and lumbar disease is one of the commonest things that we see. So a disc in the neck, compressing the spinal cord, causing a myelopathy and the upper motor neuron signs, and a disc in the lumbar region, causing a radiculopathy and the lower motor neuron signs. A new addition to the list is a condition which is a rare condition called X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. The reason that that's now come into contention is the advent of the, of the data slides on, uh, on, on the membership questions, which this lends it to itself to very well because in addition to spinal cord problems, you have adrenal insufficiency. So if there's somebody who presents with an MS-like picture, but they show you a set of used knees with a high potassium and a low sodium, just think about X-linked adrenal glucodystrophy. In children, it presents with cognitive problems and white matter lesions in the brain. In adults, more commonly with a myelopathy and sometimes also with a neuropathy. Um, catch is that they can have positive oligoclonal bands. Um, and although it's X-linked, so presenting in males, Female carriers can have a mild phenotype and a sort of a chronic fatigue-like illness. So that's your list of absent ankle jerks and extensive planters. So one last question just to see that we've got all this sorted out. A 54-year-old woman has developed difficulty walking over the last two months. Tone and power are normal in the lower limbs. The knee jerks are absent and the planter responses are extensor. What's the most likely cause of her problems? And here are the five options below. Again, I'll give you a minute to think about that. So, this is another slight variation on the absent ankle jerks and extensor planters theme. This is absent knee jerks and extensor planters. Um, but from that list, the conus medullaris lesion is the only one that's on your list of absent ankle jerks and extensor planters. Syringomalia we've talked about already. It can cause uh, upper motor neuron symptoms and signs in the legs, but the lower motor neuron signs would be at the level of the syrinx, which would typically be in the cervical or thoracic cord. A parasitical meningioma could cause upper motor neuron signs in the legs and upgoing planters, but wouldn't cause any lower motor neuron signs. Beriberi, I think, is the trick because they're trying to confuse you between thiamine deficiency and B12 deficiency. Thiamine deficiency does cause a peripheral neuropathy, um, but unless you get to the extreme form where it causes an encephalopathy, you wouldn't expect upper motor neuron signs. And cervical spondylosis, again, could cause upper motor neuron signs, but without the lower back problems, you wouldn't expect to lose your knee jerks. So that's really encompassed the whole of the spinal cord as far as the membership is concerned. So, we're going to move on now, move north, and head to the brain. Question six. A 73-year-old man is brought to the clinic by his wife. She's very worried. He's got severe nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. He's barely able to get out of bed and make it to the toilet. He's falling continuously to the left, and she finds it very difficult to hold him up. He's a history of hypertension, for which she takes ramipril and amlodipine. He's got type 2 diabetes, for which he takes metformin and glyclozide. On examination, his blood pressure is 165 over 95. The pulse is 82. 
and on examination he's got pain and numbness on the left side of the face and loss of pain and temperature sensation on the right side of the body. There's also nystagmus and a left-sided Horner's syndrome. Here are the blood results and the ECG which shows a old inferior MI and the blood results are unremarkable. So, which of the following is most likely to have been occluded? I'll give you another minute to think about that. So, the answer here is the left posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the pica. And to understand why that is, we need to look at a diagram of the brain. So, this is the classic lateral medullary syndrome. And as you can see on the diagram, that lateral and posterior part of the medulla contains the inferior cerebellar peduncle, hence ataxia on the same side. It contains the descending tract of the trigeminal nucleus, in other words, five, which will cause ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. And it contains the spinothalamic tract, which of course has already crossed over in the spine as we discussed earlier. So that will be contralateral pain and temperature to the body. So this peculiar harlequin-like division of ipsilateral face, contralateral body, is really what gives you the clue, together with the ataxia on the same side. And the full syndrome is vertigo, because of, of uh, vestibular involvement, nystagmus and ataxia towards the side of the lesion, contralateral body anesthesia and pain, ipsilateral facial anesthesia, and sometimes palatal paresis, and sometimes an ipsilateral horners. So this is the eponymous Wallenberg syndrome. So the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is the terminal branch often of the vertebral artery. So a vertebral artery occlusion will often result in this syndrome, so a vertebral artery dissection or atheromatous disease there. So it's quite a common brainstem syndrome and commonly asked about in membership. So that's the lateral medullary syndrome. So let's try another one. A 70-year-old man arrives at the accident emergency department an hour after he's felt lightheaded and collapsed to the ground. He's told two paramedics who accompanied him that he's got double vision whenever he looks to the right. And on examination, he's conscious and alert, but he has double vision and ptosis and a dilated pupil on the left. He's got a right hemiplegia, occlusion of which of the following arteries is responsible for the above neurological deficit in this patient. And here are your five options below. I'll give you a minute to think about that. So, the clues up here are that he's got double vision. And what the question is describing is a left third nerve palsy. So the left pupil's dilated and he's got a left ptosis. And he's also got a right hemiplegia. So, if you're thinking about the differential, ca differential causes for a left third nerve palsy, you might think about a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. But he's also got the right hemiplegia to explain. So we need to look further south and we need to look at the brainstem. And all of the eye movements really are controlled within the pons. So that's where we need to look. So what we need to decide is which artery supplies the pons. And that, of course, is the basilar artery. So let's look at a diagram of the pons to see how that can happen. So here in the centre of the pons, you can see the third nerve nucleus. And the tracks run anteriorly from that and come very close to the substantia nigra and the cerebral peduncle. So if you have a small vessel stroke from 
branch of the basilar artery, which is running down at the bottom of the picture, not visible on this picture, um, then it can easily pick off the third nerve fibers together with the cerebral peduncle. And the cerebral peduncle is, of course, crossed with respect to the body, whereas the third nerve is on the same side. So you're going to get ipsilateral third nerve palsy and contralateral uh, hemiparesis. So that is a classic Weber's syndrome. There are various other brain syndromes you can get. If you're further north, you can get a problem with up gaze and what's called a paranoid syndrome. Um, but those are the major ones that are asked about in the exam. Here's a general question about strokes. A 75-year-old woman has suffered from six TIAs involving transient weakness and poor coordination of the left side. She has a history of hypertension, which is managed with ramipril and indapamide, but no other significant past medical history. And on examination, her blood pressure is 155 over 90, and the pulse, 75 and regular. But she has a right carotid brewery. Here are some investigations, and of note, she's got a 50% right internal carotid artery stenosis, which undoubtedly is the cause for that brewery. So the question is, which of the following is the most appropriate way to manage her? And here are your five options. It's quite likely that her events are coming from that carotid artery. But actually, the evidence base for doing a carotid endarterectomy is only if the carotid stenosis is more than 70%. So the answer here is double antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and dipyridamol. And let me just go through that with you a little bit more detail. So if you have 100% stenosis of a carotid, there's nothing to be done. So the uh, indication for endarterectomy is only really between 70 and 99%. If she doesn't tolerate aspirin, then clopidogrel would be indicated. But the uh, Royal College guidelines state that aspirin and dipyridamol should be used as the first line. The indication for warfarin would be if she has either atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And that's an absolute indi indication. So unless there's anything that stops her having that, then that should be what she receives if she's got AF or paroxysmal AF. With regard to other secondary prevention, she should have statins if a cholesterol, fasting cholesterol is more than 3.5. And she should have blood pressure treatment if her blood pressure is more than 130 over 80. And the usual rule for that is in the elderly or the black population, you start with a thiazide. In the younger white population, you start with an ACE inhibitor or with an angiotensin II inhibitor if um, the ACE inhibitor causes a problem. Um, and then if the target's not achieved in either group, then you add in the other. So that, in a nutshell, is stroke secondary prevention. Let's talk a little bit more about strokes and classification. So the Oxford or the Bamford classification divides into lacuna strokes, partial anterior circulation strokes, total anterior circulation strokes, and posterior circulation strokes. And the key feature of a lacuna stroke is that it only involves one modality. So it's pure motor or pure sensory. These are tiny little infarcts involving the internal capsule. And because the motor fibers are all coming down through the frontal lobe and the sensory fibers are all going up in the parietal lobe, they're separate. So you wouldn't get motor and sensory involved together in a lacunar infarct. So typically it's hand and face, or it may be hand and face and some slurred speech, um, or it's pure sensory. Um, in a partial anterior circulation stroke, you've got more than that, but not the whole territory. So you might have motor and sensory involved, or you might have 
some higher cortical function involved, such as a dysphasia or a hemianopia, together with a hemiparesis. In a total anterior circulation stroke, it's the whole of the carotid territory that's wiped out. So it's the middle cerebral and the anterior cerebral artery that, that are wiped out. So you're expecting a complete um, hemiparesis and a hemianopia and often sensory neglect. In a posterior circulation stroke, it might be one of the brainstem syndromes we've talked about before, or if it's just the top, you might have an isolated hemianopia but without any other associated weakness or sensory loss. And if it's just the cerebellum involved, which it quite often is, you get an isolated unilateral ataxia. So let's talk a little bit about those higher cortical syndromes because they're quite popular in membership. So I've divided it by region. So the frontal lobe, remember, is motor. So the aspects of speech which are involved are also motor. So in a Broca's motor aphasia, you know what to say, you just can't make the word. The frontal eye fields are also in the frontal lobe and they can give you a clue in stroke. So if there's an ischemic stroke and that frontal eye field is switched off, the eyes will tend to deviate away from the side of the lesion. Whereas in an irritative lesion such as uh, hemorrhage, then the eyes actually deviate towards the side of the lesion. The frontal lobes also involve mood and volition. There's a thing called abulia, which is the apathy and loss of normal emotionality that you get sometimes in a frontal lobe or in a basal ganglia lesion. The parietal lobe is sensory, so as well as somatic sensation, it's visuospatial awareness, relating things in space to where they are in the body, and that's something that's quite often asked about. So perception of objects coming towards you in that relevant field. And because the parietal lobe on one side looks after the body on the other side, it also looks after visual space on the other side. So something coming in from the right in the vision will actually be picked up in the left parietal lobe. And then there's a particular syndrome which is very popularly asked about which is at the junction between the parietal and the temporal lobe in what's called the angular gyrus, and this is Gerstmann syndrome. So this gives you left-right disorientation, finger agnosia, in other words, inability to name a finger. It gives you agraphia and acalculia. If you move down into the temporal lobe, obviously in the dominant, which is usually the left temporal lobe, you're looking at speech and language. On the right side, it's less clear what the temporal lobe does, but one of the recognised functions that is recognition of faces, so-called prosopagnosia. And the occipital lobe, of course, is visual perception. So that's how the cortical syndromes break down. So here's another question on the same theme. So this is a 23-year-old woman who, after delivery, developed severe diarrhoea and vomiting over 24 hours. And despite intravenous fluid replacement, she's become very confused. She has a generalized tonic-clonic seizure and a left hemiparesis. What's the most likely cause? And here are your lists below. I'll give you another minute to think about that. Okay, so let's talk through these. The first thing that probably comes to your mind when you think about someone who's just delivered and uh, has a seizure would be eclampsia. But the key feature of the question here is that she's actually delivered 24 hours ago and it would be very, very rare to have preeclampsia postpartum. The other clue here is that she's been vomiting a lot, so she's become dehydrated. And having just given birth, she's in a prothrombotic state and this would be a classic presentation for a sagittal sinus thrombosis and the key lesson here is that not all strokes are arterial and the features that point out a venous stroke typically are fluctuation and 
seizures. So it's much more common to have a seizure accompanying a venous stroke than it is an arterial stroke. So vertebral artery dissection would be very unlikely. Um, and she's had some fluid replacement, so hyponatremia is unlikely. We wouldn't cause this sort of picture. And an amniotic fluid embolism, again, it would be very late to present. So in clinical practice, sinus thrombosis is a very important thing not to miss. But it is also a question that's asked about in the membership. And particularly with data slides, you might have a, a slide which shows a thrombophilia screen. Um, and that might be a clue to, to the etiology. Most sinus thromboses aren't associated with a recognized thrombophilia. The common things would be dehydration or other things like uh, inflammatory bowel disease. But there's a whole long list, including rarities like Betchett's, which can be associated with sinus thrombosis. And typically it fluctuates. It's associated with drowsiness, neither of which are really prominent features of, 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 uh, of arterial stroke. And uh, the common uh, finding of, uh, of seizures associated with, with the ictus. Here's the last question. A 31-year-old woman is admitted with a collapse at work. And by the time she's admitted to the emergency room, she's complaining of a severe headache and drowsiness. The only medication of note is a combined oral contraceptive pill. On examination, she's hypotensive. She's got a blood pressure of 95 over 60. And there's a, no visual response in the right eye. The left eye shows a peripheral temporal field loss and a partial third nerve palsy. Here are the blood test results. The important things, as I'm sure you've picked up, is that potassium is high and the sodium is slightly low. So which of the following is the most likely cause? And here are your five options. And again, I'll give you a minute to think about that. So they've really given you all the clues there that this is a pituitary problem. Um, she's got a visual field loss, which is complex, involving the whole of one eye and half of the other. And the only place you ever get that sort of problem is in a chiasmal lesion. And then they've given you the clue of the collapse and the abnormal eusinese, suggesting that she's becoming Addisonian. So this would be a typical picture for pituitary apoplexy. And of course, very often in that situation, you get mass effect, so you can allow a false localizing sign of a third nerve palsy. So in a, in a posterior communicating artery aneurysm, you might have a third nerve palsy, you might have a collapse, but you wouldn't expect that pattern of visual loss. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is more on the same theme. In a basal artery thrombosis, as we said, you could have a third nerve palsy, but although if, if you had uh, an extension into the occipital lobes, you might have a homonymous visual loss, you're not going to get that discordant visual field loss that we've seen in this question. And an extradural hemorrhage really would cause loss of consciousness, but none of the other features. So pituitary apoplexy is one to remember, and it comes up quite a lot in membership. So here are all those points summarized. Let's talk a little bit more now about visual fields. So if you start at the front of the visual pathway and work backwards, a monocular visual field problem has to be from one eye or the optic nerve behind it, between the eye and the chiasm. And the sorts of things you might see would be a central scotoma with the middle of the visual field lost, typically following optic neuritis in MS, or an altitudinal field loss, in other words, the upper or the lower half of the vision in an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And that might be non-arteritic due to small vessel cerebral artery disease, such as diabetes, or it might be arteritic, classically in temporal arteritis.
to move further back. Um, binocular visual field loss with enlarged blind spots implies raised intracranial pressure rather than any specific lesion of the optic pathways themselves. But if you have a bitemporal lesion, it has to be in the chiasm, as in the previous question. And if you have an isolated homonymous hemianopia, it really has to be right back in the occipital lobe because the visual tracts, as they pass through the cortex, are intimately involved in other brain areas. And there are certain syndromes that you need to remember that go with a particular pattern of field loss. The typical one they like to ask about is a superior quadrantinopia. And if you remember that the brain is backwards way on and the vision is all backwards way on because the visual image falls on the retina back to front and upside down, then it's easy to remember. So if something is in a left superior quadrant, then the fibres are going to be right inferior. And the typical thing would that be a temporal lobe lesion. If you remember, there's a loop of optic radiation that goes forward through the temporal lobe called Mayer's loop, and that can be picked off uh, and just cause an isolated quadrantinopia and a temporal lobe syndrome. Conversely, if you have an inferior quadrantinopia, it's likely to be up in the parietal lobe on the opposite side. So, that's the end of lecture one. So, so far we've already covered the spinal cord, and we've talked about the various spinal cord syndromes, brown saccard syndrome, anterior spinal cord syndromes, dorsal cord syndromes, we've talked about syrinxes, we've talked about conus lesions, we've talked about problems with the brain, brainstem strokes, cortical stroke syndromes, We've talked a little bit about venous strokes and a little bit about stroke management. And then we've covered optic fields with problems with the optic nerve, the chiasm, and the optic radiation. Thank you very much.